We are recording. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good morning. And for our friends from India, good afternoon. Um, we are moving on to session two for the day. In the next 60 minutes, we're going to take you through a couple of things. We're going to begin with me laying out the outline for what coding is, the basics of coding, essentially. And then I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Bakshish, and he's going to take us through the installation of Anaconda and also give us a run through of Jupyter Notebooks, which is going to be the primary platform we are going to run Python on. So I hope you're all as excited as we are to deliver this. Now, I'm going to quickly share my screen with you. All right, I want to share a window. Yeah. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Everyone, okay. I can see uh, Nuno nodding, so I'm going to assume that's for everyone. Yes, we can see. Great. So what is coding? Right, we have been well, hearing. Yes, yeah. yes, maybe you can, you can make the full screen. Oh, I absolutely. Oh, just a second. Yeah. I'm going to put it on. Is this better? Yeah, yes. Better. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Of course. Um, so yeah, what is coding? We've all heard this term thrown around, right? And it's very fancy now to introduce this in conversations. It's not scary, but I can understand. Uh, like me, um, when I was introduced to coding, I thought it was like going to be a lot of math, a lot of statistics, and I was a little apprehensive. But as I got into it, I realized how much fun it was. So believe me, as someone who also learned coding from scratch, coding isn't just about math or statistics or developing software applications or web applications or your apps, mobile apps or games. No, coding at its core is about taking a problem, critically analyzing it and solving it. So think of it as a puzzle that you're putting together. And I'm sure we all like putting puzzles together. Now, if I look at all of you and I tell you, hey, you know, I would like to make a pizza this weekend, but I don't know how to go about it. Could you give me instructions? I'm sure you'd give me a list of ingredients and then you would give me a step-by-step -step instruction manual, right? You would tell me, hey, take some flour, put salt, take meat, mix it with pepperoni. I know that's not the recipe for pizza and definitely do not try what I just said to make pizzas, but you that's what you would do, right? So code is exactly that. Code is essentially a set of instructions that are transmitted or communicated to a computer. But is it as easy as that? Not really. Because when we are talking about coding and computers, the only caveat is that computers do not understand instructions or language the way we do, right? Humans and computers do, do not absorb information the same way. So computers cannot understand language in English or in Spanish or in uh, Portuguese, they can only understand commands that are written out in what we call binary, which means in zeros and ones. But can you imagine writing out instructions, a set of instructions just in zeros and ones? We are going to be here forever. That is where programming languages come in. So programming languages, what they do is they take our instructions in the language that we have typed it in, for instance, English, and they convert it behind the scenes into zeros and ones and run it and give us the outcome. So it's a very easy way to write a code, which then later gets translated behind the scenes into zeros and ones that the computers can understand and give us the output. We have a lot of popular languages today, programming languages, and every day you are very often you hear of a new programming language that has been developed, right? 
Some of the famous ones are Python, R, JavaScript, C++, so many, many more, right? And all of them are used for various purposes. And some of them are multi-purpose. So you can use them for more than one thing. They are used from everything from web development to creation of software applications, mobile apps, in science, you name it, you have coding. I'm going to delve into this a little more deeply in the next few minutes. Now, and this is my favorite part. I was telling Beatrice during the break that even though I am not a newbie to this field, when I was researching for this presentation, I was honestly awestruck with where we have come today with coding. The applications for this in industries today, just amazing. So let's, let's look at a couple of them. The first one, without a doubt, is an information tech, right? And this is perhaps the most obvious and the most commonly thrown around use of coding. We use coding to create software applications. We use it for developing websites, for various web applications, for creating e-commerce platforms like Amazon and Flipkart. We also use it for creating apps, games on iOS and Android. Healthcare. In healthcare, we use it primarily for two purposes. One is for the creation of what we call the EHRs or the electronic health records. Think of them as digital medical histories for patients. So these are essentially secure organized folders for doctors and hospital officials to keep our health information and at the click of a button to update it, to access it and to transmit it across countries. Imagine if you're moving from India to Canada, at the click of a button, you can send your file. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, this massively reduces paperwork and it elevates patient care. In addition, we know that it is also used for medical imaging. There are softwares created for analyzing medical images, MRIs, CT scans, where you're using high-tech computers to look inside your bodies and see what could potentially be wrong. I, um, I'm just reminded of something Beatrice said. Um, Please, if I'm going a little faster or if there is something that is inaudible or illegible, please feel free to stop me and ask me to repeat it. I'm more than happy to. Going on. In the okay. automotive. Yeah. Sorry, did someone say something? No, it is perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just... Thank you. Next, the next industry we are going to delve into is the automotive or the automobile industry. Here, we know and we have seen that it is used from everything from your self-driving vehicles, which is now being all the rage all over. It is the programs and the software developed by coders that help the vehicles perceive their immediate environment and to ensure that they are driving across Paths that are free of humans, free of another vehicle, free of any kind of equipment, avoid accidents and make other driving decisions. Coding is also the crux behind your navigation and diagnostic softwares like your GPS. And it is also the crux behind the entertainment systems that we see in your vehicles. Next. And this is again, like the IT departments, a very common application of coding, retail and e-commerce. Coding is used in everything from inventory management, meaning this is what essentially helps retailers and warehouses check for the right amount of products to see, that, see whether you have popular items in stock. And ensuring that they never run out of it. It helps them in real time, monitor the trend of sales for various products, make sure that they are predicting future demand for products co correctly based on historical patterns of sales and based on current market demand. Coding also helps them automate systems, right? Where behind the scenes, the reordering processes for products is 
it happens on its own without anyone needing to go and check on it. So essentially, when stock levels reach a certain threshold, the system can automatically generate purchase orders mm -hmm. and thereby reduce the risk of errors. And then this is something that we have often um, had conversations about how we get a lot of personalized recommendations, right? That is also something that happens behind the screens, we, uh, which does enhance our shopping experience. So this is done when the e-commerce platforms use coding to collect, analyze vast amounts of consumer data. They use our purchase histories, our browsing behavior and preferences and recommend products and services to us and thereby increasing sales for themselves. The next one is energy. It is being, and this is a newer field where coding has seen a resurgence. Here, coders are constantly working on software that help maintain your grids, optimize energy distribution across regions, and also constantly monitoring and optimizing power generation behind the scenes and monitoring consumption in real time to ensure there is no wastage. Again, a topic that is so popular right now and being talked about since we know we are, we might be nearing, um, you know, a, or we might be nearing a scarcity of resources. And this is where coding has is also being greatly used in the field of renewable energy. It is extremely essential to monitor your solar panels and wind turbines. It actually precisely helps manage energy and ensures efficiency of these systems. It helps store the energy that is created from renewable energy sources like the sun and the wind in batteries. Um, and also, this is very crucial because in periods of high demand, you, even if there is, isn't enough supply in real time, you can use the store reserves right, to provide electricity to people. Moving on, it is being used in environmental science. How this works is coders actually can develop climate models that are perfect simulations of the earth. And they take into account various variables like the earth's temperature, atmospheric composition, ocean currents, etc. And based on this, at any given point in time, they can predict how a human activity can have an impact in a region. So they can also add other variables like greenhouse emissions or pollution, because the pollution levels will be different across regions and across points in time. They can take into account the sea level rise or any extreme weather events. And this helps them not only predict a future climactic disaster, they can, it also helps them prepare for it to minimize loss of both human casualties as well as other resources. And it obviously is something that is being very, very commonly now used to create climactic policies. And this is something that we saw during the recent G20 summit that was held in New Delhi, India, where for months before the summit, if not years, climate models were being simulated and these results were presented. Next is finance. Um, and it's amazing the things they are doing in finance. You know, they do everything from managing portfolios to analyzing data, large amounts of historical data and market trends to predict for the investors the best portfolios, the best distribution or amalgamation of stocks, shares and assets. They can also predict in real time the level of risk and tell you exactly when to buy into or to sell out from the market. Something very interesting that coding is applied for is algorithmic trading. Um, I don't know if you remember, and I've seen this in older movies, where you had these stock traders, 50 or 100 of them on the stock trading floor, calling out commands. They would ask to buy or to sell these stocks and shares. Now with coding, we can just do it with the click of a button behind the scenes in real time. And we can perform thousands and thousands of high frequency um, 
trade buys and shares. In addition, and I've saved the best for the last, since I know uh, a majority of us are from these two fields of education and architecture. So education, um, it's especially during the COVID pandemic, we saw how coding and programming has completely revolutionized the field of education. In fact, we have a separate domain now called e-learning. And this has enabled us to take classes and learn from computers, learn from teachers in real time, and also have access to recorded lectures like what we are doing right now. So many of us couldn't uh, attend this in real time, a lot of my friends. And for, or they couldn't attend all of the sessions across four days. But the good thing is in today's time, they never have to miss it because you have a recording of these available. And these recording tools have been made possible by coding. It's used to build platforms like Microsoft Teams, websites where you are able to watch video lessons, take quizzes, interact with teachers, students, um, with the experts in our fields across the world. So it's exactly like having a virtual classroom at the tip of our fingers. Teachers are also now, and I'm sure some of you here will be able to speak more to this than I can, but a data analysis is something that is also being very commonly used now in education, where you are collecting huge amounts of historical patterns and it's helping you to make informed decisions and personalized decisions about every student in your class something that was very unheard of before. Um, you at the click of a button, you get access to test scores, you get access to attendance scores, you get access to literally every single academic variable that can help predict a student's performance or help you assess where a student might need more help. Um, and this obviously ensures better learning experiences and like I mentioned, personalized education for students. And finally, architecture. And I do know there are quite a few architects here. So coding is being used across so many laterals and verticals in architecture. Today, it is being used in parametric design where you can create adaptable designs by defining parameters or adjusting parameters as needed. You can create designs you for specific criteria at the click of a button and again adapt it to specific project requirements. You can use it to manage your projects. There are a lot of tools that are that Codos coding provides you with. You can create a lot of AR and VR applications for immersive design experiences. It truly does improve something that I've grown to know is for architects, it's and for urban planners, it's extremely important to constantly immerse themselves in the spatial environment of the region where they their pro current project is situated or is to be built. So coding is something that makes it so easy to do that. And, it, and also a lot of tasks as architects, naturally you would like to spend a lot of your time creating things, right? On the creative part of it. So coding is something that helps you do that because behind the scenes, you can automate the more menial repetitive tasks. And this helps you reduce errors and save a massive amount of time and essentially focus a large part of your time doing what originally got you into this field, right? I'm sure none of you came into these fields because you liked documentation. So that is something coding helps with. And this is something that is true for across sectors. A lot of repetitive menial tasks can get automated behind the scenes. Of course, this is not the end of it. Coding is used in every sector today, but I've only been given 15 minutes. So it is definitely the end of my presentation. With that, I thank you. And I'm happy to have a conversation about this later on or go into details if anyone would like to. And for now, I would like to hand it over to Bakshish. Thank you. Thank you, Genji, for uh, beautifully explaining the basics of coding and uh, the larger idea of coding, That's how I would like to put it. I hope I'm audible. Yes. 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 Thank you. 
thank you for that confirmation so proceeding forward in this session i would uh, be sharing a few questions to begin with so that just to see where everybody stands and then accordingly we can proceed with uh, with the rest of the sessions so i'll be sharing a link with everybody on the chat so just request if uh, the participants can answer the question so the question is what is the domain of your work this is to get an understanding of how you as participants can use the the the, the concepts of coding in your particular field and also to get to know the wide variety of fields from which people are coming here from meanwhile i'll share my screen to also show how the results are populating this is second uh yes is it visible yes we are so this will keep getting populated and this is also something that these are some visualizations which i've also used coding by the way so as people will answer the whole uh, word cloud will get formed out of it so yeah i really find it very fascinating so we have architecture cities construction arts management higher education we have more so the as the cloud for architecture is getting big it represents that more number of people are coming from the same field and it so this is again another way of using code in a way that uh, it represents so we have music musicology as well and urban planning construction urban economics cities cultural economics this is bakshish this is a real practical proof to how to yes. use this technology no thank you yeah yes thank you william urban economics international non governmental organizations law but as you can see the the block of architecture is the biggest so again another way that coding represents how the count on which the one particular word has got has gotten bigger so another way of that now i'll share another link which will have another question so this is to understand if you have tried coding ever before so this will also help me and other uh, resource persons to sort of uh, take this forward ahead mm, yes just we can move on to answer this one now yes, i hope it's visible uh, has the new yeah i think yeah it's, it has gone so now the wait i'll share my screen with that Yes, is it visible? Yes. Yes. So this is just to get an idea that how familiar people are with coding. Yes. So I've given three options. First option being what is basically what is coding. What is that? I don't know about it. Second, I have a fair idea, but I've never tried coding because a lot of us have heard have heard these names like Python, uh, NumPy, Pandas. or other ways in which coding is being used while there are, i'm sure there would be some people who would have tried it as well so we have an equal five each interesting all right I, i have got a fair idea now so as like you know a lot of us may not have tried coding but i'm assuming a lot of us would have heard of excel ms excel or would have used ms excel in in our different kinds of uh, work that we do so 
so this one is about ms excel so i just thought that before we directly jump into coding how about we sort of see like we may or may not have we may have indirectly used a little bit of coding on excel because code excel also pro uh, provides that option so the last question that i'm providing this question has option for that that how familiar are you with ms excel so we can then proceed with either we can direct we can proceed with ms excel to sort of get a hand of the basics or we can also directly proceed with the coding part i hope that uh, partners have installed uh, anaconda and jupyter notebook and i'll just share my screen So five people have intermediate level proficiency in Excel. It's good to see that. So I'll be posing a few questions to the participants. So it will be good to learn for everybody and for me as well that how maybe the, the, the question I would raise, there are multiple ways to address it. And it will be fun to see how different participants have their ways to looking at it. And you can also unmute an answer once we begin. Yeah, 11 people have been level questions in Excel. Interesting. We'll start with Excel and then we can proceed with the, the real coding side of things. Mm -hmm. So I have a data set which I'll be sharing here. I hope uh, you will be able to receive it through the chat function. Just a second. Yeah. <laughs> Just a second, the data set is not coming out great. Yeah. Uh, is it visible in the chat? A data set? No. No, not yet. Okay. Or I can do one more thing. I can share the data set on my screen and I'll ask a question and those who people can uh, try having a look at the question and answering me how the particular question can be worked on. Is the data set visible? Yes, it is. Yes, so this data set is of uh, a different climate change related variables where I have data set of last 20 years of all the countries on climate change. So, for example, access to electricity in reference to population, access to clean, uh, clean fuels for cooking, renewable electricity, etc. So my question to the audience is if I have to find blank spots, like, for example, this is one blank spot. So, for example, for Armenia, I don't have the data point for uh, the renewables, the renewable energy share. So how do I find the blank spots? Like this is for like again for Azerbaijan or uh, so there are some zeros, but there are no null. I mean, I'm particularly asking for null values. So like these are some null values. I can find these null values through counting them, but that is manually very tiring and the data set runs to around 3000 figures. So if you are asked to find blank null values to find out that 
for which are the values for which we don't have any data, null values. So can anyone tell me how can this be done? You can unmute and tell me as well. Or you can you can also type in the chat. Meanwhile, yes. Try to yes. Hmm, not through coding. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for the response. So this is uh, another way that uh, this can be done. Coding is one way, but non-coding way. If you also know a way that we can do it without coding, that's also fine. Wait, I'll just try to. So uh, has anybody heard of conditional formatting here? I'll just show how we can. Yes. Somebody was speaking. So I'll just show how we can use conditional formatting on this data set and through conditional formatting how we can show the null values in the data set. So as you can see in the home, home button, there is an option here called conditional formatting. If I go here and uh, so there are some rules that I can apply just like in coding, we apply some rules. We can also apply some rules in Excel as well. So for example, if I go to the option equal to and uh, so now I can select a particular bar. For example, if I select uh, the whole column J and uh, maybe these two columns, and uh, I mentioned that the text should become green. And uh, but I need to also see what is what should it go as what should it equal what should the equivalent of conditional formatting be? So. So here I go highlight and uh, yes. So in addition to that, by the way, we can also do top 10 items, bottom 10 items. So this will this will arrange the data set in the way we want to. And this way it, it really becomes easy to manage it. So for example, if I also say that I want a value which is. Um, yeah, this is the custom if I you can also go with custom formatting. So. Over here, this is again, we can fill in the details and this will give us the results of uh, the, the particular figure that we are working towards. So these are some of the options that if I want to color the data set. So I have already solved some part of it. Maybe I think just to also save on time, I can show you how I did it. I have the solved part of it, which I can show in my another slide. Just resharing my screen once again. Is the screen visible? Not yet. Not yet. Yes, is it is it visible now? Hello. Yes. 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 So so for example, like I was telling, if I go if I select this tab and I go to conditional formatting and I add any number here, like uh, in the equal to value, if I say zero and I say that it should be in. So you can can you see the color has for this particular row has changed. There are some green highlights. Yes, yes, we can see. So, so in this way, if you 
if I want to find these null values, I don't have to count them. They can direct, they'll directly come here and I can see it for the entire data set, which are the countries for which there's no information available. Either it's I can put the like value. Also, if I go on conditional formatting, it will also give me an in between value. So if I say that I want a value in between 500, that's very big figure for this particular cell. But uh, so this is this column is for access to clean cooking of fuels. So if I say that I want to arrange it in a particular order, I go to conditional formatting. I, I go on highlight and I say I need values in between 50 and 90. So this will now. Once I give this command, so now you can see it has automatically arranged the values which are more than 50 and highlighted them for me. For so which will help me understand that these are the countries which has the highest the higher order. Similarly, if I want to arrange them, um, has has anyone here used the sort or the filter feature in Excel sorting and filtering? Yes, I, I do. I do use sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. So the sorting and filtering feature, it's on the top right side of Excel. Once I go here and if I go on, for example, I go on countries and I want to sort out the countries with respect to the years. So now I can get data for particular year. So maybe let's try to have data for the recent year 2020. So now instead of looking at all the years of data, now I can only focus on the data for the year 2020 and focus on focus my analysis for that particular year. I think somebody is speaking. No. Yes, so this now allows me to look at the particular country, particular year 2020's data. So for example, now if I have to arrange this data in a particular order such that I know which are the countries which have highest amount of uh, investments which are being uh, made or even uh, let's look at uh, if, if anybody has something in the a doubt right now in their mind please also feel free to stop me and tell me where are you facing any doubts here okay. there's no doubt so yeah so if I look at uh, the electricity from fossil fuel and uh, if I try to sort it from, for example, smallest to largest. Yes, so now as you can see, so now I have a complete information that, OK, these are the countries which have uh, for like less number of electricity from less amount of fossil fuel energy or more. So as you can see, the order of the countries has also changed. Now it's not Afghanistan at the top, it's Albania, which has zero electricity from fossil fuels. While if I go down, now I can see that the highest amount of electricity from fossil fuels by was generated by China in the year 2020. Second was United States and then India and then Japan. So this sorting has allowed me to get a uh, understanding of which are the countries which are being uh, generating highest amount of electricity from fossil fuels. Similarly, I can use this feature or any of the data set, any of the value that I want to, and this will give me a sort of a understand, like a ballpark figure of which countries are using more amount of electricity from fossil fuels or any other filter that I want. Or maybe let's also apply this to this value, low carbon electricity with reference to the percentage of electricity. So this represents a percentage value here. And uh, yeah, so. Yes. So again, uh, this has applied to the entire data set, which is for all the years because we did not apply the filter here because I had un had undone the filter, filter feature here. Yes, so. Uh, any doubts here? I see that it's 2.15 and uh, please help me. Is it some that should we stop here for the break or shall I continue? Right, you can go ahead. I think it's clear. All right.
yes so if i have to so now i'll try to sort the data as per the gdp per capita so this is as you can see the gdp per capita row and uh, so just to get a sense of the amount of gdp per capita for the country wise now again i'll apply the filter feature which will help me get the data for a particular year let's look at 2020 and yeah so now going to gdp per capita and if i i can sort it and it will give me an exact sort of a like uh, an ascending order but i don't want to do that i want to have it specifically for different uh, like i want to create a set with all the colors so if i say gdp less than um, let's have it less than 4000 us dollars and have it in red then similarly i can also apply multiple conditional formatting so in this if i say that uh, let's have it uh, you can do it in between as well so let's go in between and i have it in between 4001 and 8000 this will be let's mark it as yellow and let's apply a third one which is or greater than 8000 and marking it green so now if i look at the data set can you see the like the way it's uh, a complete blank a white screen has now got some colors so now you can see yes. let me hide this part so everybody can see it with the countries yes so now if i want to look at these countries and create a, a, a figure out of it it's much easier to understand and sort of if somebody you are explaining something to anybody like to your students or in your in your in your office this way it the visual data set looks much more easily comprehensible and it's easy to sort of also look at it in a way that it's easy for the eyes to figure out which are the countries which have higher gdp per capita or we can use it for any other feature as well and i can also similarly do it for access to electricity so if i just put it a value between 0 and 50 to understand which are the countries which have lower amount of access to electricity so again like it gives me that highlighting so this is this is important where we can also relate with these so for example chad as a country it has less gdp per capita and it also has less percent 11% of its population have access to electricity as as the percentage of population so we are able to relate with gdp per capita and access to electricity being provided so again how these two are relatable is something with which we can relate different uh, parameters so let's also try it with one more so you are able to see also that how gdp per capita here is now related to access with to electricity so as part of any study which can also which, which is being performed that's why it's easy to look at the figures and then work towards it as well and if i apply a feature on uh, on the higher side of it this will also if i apply a feature on the higher side so if i say greater than 80% and put it with green so yes as you can see a lot of the countries uh, which have higher gdp also have higher percentage of uh, access to electricity so this is like something that data was not speaking but we made the data be like conditionally formatted in such a manner that it's easily readable for uh, for people and uh, yeah but at the same time this can this this cannot be an hypothesis because as you can also see a country guyana doesn't have it's a it has middle it's it's gdp per capita is 6955 us dollars but it still has higher amount of uh, access to electricity 
so this is also to say that that there are they have a correlation but at the same time this cannot be said that all the countries with higher gdp will definitely have uh, full access to electricity so just to also look at it in a way that we are not blinded by it but data is guiding us in us in such a manner that we are able to make informed inferences out of the data that we are that we are using like uh, let me also figure out some more anomalies so for example indonesia in terms of our the criteria that we made for gdp it has less than 4000 us dollars gdp uh, for gdp per capita but at the same time it has 97% close to 97% of access to electricity so again the correlation is there but it's not a absolute correlation that's what i'm trying to explain here any doubts from these because i think more than these things the idea is to also get to know how it is done so if anybody has any doubts to this also this can also be done in google sheets if uh, i'm sure a lot of people would have also used google sheets google sheets also offer this feature so this can also be tried on google sheets while i am doing some other conditional formatting but any if anybody has any doubts here Excuse me. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes. I I posted. Uh, maybe you already explained it. I don't know. Uh, how can I replace the empty empty cells by NA? Not available. So as the oh. statistical software afterwards uh, understands that the empty cell is not a zero. Okay. That it is a oh. data. It is a data that is not available. Hmm. Thank you. I think I, I I lost your voice in the uh, in the middle. If you can repeat the question. Uh, the question is in the chat. Can you read the chat, please? Sure. Thank you. How to replace empty cells by a name? Thank you. Yes. So uh, this can be done with the find and replace option of uh, Excel. So yes. So yes. One because way to do it. Yes. 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 No, no, it is important so as the software, uh, the statistical software doesn't understand that the empty cell is zero. Okay, so we need we need to say that the empty cell is not available. And thank you, thank you, Baxis. Yes. So as you can see, uh, I hope the screen is visible. Yes. Yes. So what I did, what I so in every Excel file, there's an option search option where I went and there's a there's a uh, tool called find and replace. So mm -hmm. in the find and replace tool, I so basically what I did, there was, I left it. I the, I left the find what screen blank and mm -hmm. I replaced it with replace with with any. So now, as you can see, uh, Excel is saying that we have made four four hundred and ninety two replacements in the Excel sheet. So as you can see in the background, all the sheets, all the parts where it was blank, now NA has been replaced by it. So this can be done through the find and replace option of uh, MS Excel. Okay, thank you. Yes, so now you can see all of it is replaced. And if I remove the filter, let's check that if it has done it for the entire data set or so yes it has done it for all the years or oh, all the years from 2000 to 2020 they have been replaced by na now but yes i see some of it they have missed it so i think it was done only for the year 2020 
Yes, it has only done it for the year 2020. That is the reason because we had applied a filter for 2020. That's why it's been done for that particular year. And yes, and as you can see, that the countries are not right now arranged in an alphabetical order because we have applied filters for the for the data set. If I replace the filters, it will automatically again go back to 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 do that. You come again to the top. Bottom uh, top right corner and press here, and then the filters then through this button gets removed. Mm, also, so while we are there is another tool that Excel offers, which is uh, just go to the bottom and apply some of those. Yeah. Hmm. So, uh, what Excel also provides in Excel, you can also do a count if feature. In the the count if feature allows us to tell Excel that it will only it will only show a particular. Uh, Number like for example, if I like I did a count if value, I I counted the number of null values through the conditional formatting. Similarly, that can also be done through other ways. And uh, one of the tools that is used is uh, count if. Count if allows us to look at it through the particular. Uh, so when I select a particular cell, and uh, I say that I want to count if a part, I give a particular uh, value to it. So that value can be in the range that I give. I can give it a particular. So if I say count if zero, so it will give me the count of the number of zeros that are there, and mm -hmm. it can also be greater than or less than. Or yes, somebody has unmuted. No, okay. I think some disturbances. So yeah. So it will also then help me understand that if I want to count, I can count only if I give them give Excel a condition. And as per that condition, Excel will give me the count. So I'll just now give it a particular range. So yes. Uh, first step, we do one is equal to. Then I go on the type. So if I go on a normal count, I can give it a range. Like for example, I give so it gives me eight as the count here, as per the formula that I applied to it, which was for all the zero values. So, so right now it I I only did it for three six four three cell number two, but if I go through this value, now yeah, it's going me, it's giving me an entire. For the entire data set, so this includes zero values and non-zero values as well. So this is basically count of the number of uh, uh, cells that I have chosen. But this, so there are different commands in count as well. So, for example, if I say count. So there is count ifs, count blank. So right now I replaced. Uh, wait, I can also. I can try because it did not replace all the for all the years. So if I go on count blank, and if I give a range, mm, so yeah. So instead of doing conditional formatting, we can also provide Excel with a particular range. If I give the range from n1 to n3650 and then close it, so it has given me a count of the blank values, which is 253. So the highlight feature of conditional formatting highlighted the part which was having a particular uh, like with green color, red color, whichever color. But count blank gives me the amount of blanks that are there. So this is excluding the year 2020. Why? Because we already had replaced the 2020 values with NA. So it will not give me for 2020 because that is already NA. But if I give like for example, example if I give it with this particular but this is also like the very starting point of coding so this mm -hmm. is a command that i'm giving through code count blank from m1 
to M3650. M is mm -hmm. the, on the top, as you can see the row, and then we have this value. So if I go, so there are 33 blank values in this. And similarly, this can be done for all the parameters that I have with me. Like, let's see, I think this one should be the highest if I go for it. Yeah. So this should give me a high number. 2033 blank values on the percentages. So instead of counting, this will directly give me the numbers and it's very easy to then hold the figures if there is a huge data set because otherwise it's very difficult to manually calculate all of this. I hope I'm not going too fast or if there is anybody having any doubt. It's, it's correct. Yes. So um, shall we uh, go ahead with uh, Python or shall we, or I think I've, I've, I, I, mean, I don't want everything to also go on top of the participants head. So it will be good if people can share on the chat or unmute and tell me if I'm going too fast or if you have any doubts in these because Excel is the most basic form of coding that most of us have used it otherwise, but we don't know that there are some codes that are being also used in Excel. So, so there are many other features as well that Excel provides. Um, some and I think some divide addition subtraction, a lot of us would have already used this. And other than that, uh, the count if feature that I just did, count blank and other features. But, but yes, so maybe uh, let's look at it. Um, uh, can I go ahead with the visualizations for Excel? Or yes. do you think? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Thank you. So Excel also provides a lot of uh, visualizations. So I'll share another sheet where I have performed some of the visualizations for so that it's easier for everybody to relate with that. And yeah, I'll just reshare my screen. Yes, uh, is it visible? Yes. No. Yes. Yes. So uh, I'm using, I've used the same data set, but uh, what I've done, so I have divided it in different set of, uh, so Excel allows you to create sheets. So it's the same data set, but I've divided it in different sheets. So in this sheet, what I have done, so they uh, provided us with the density of the population and land area. And uh, through that, I calculated the population. So this is some like I've just supplied uh, the basic formula here to calculate the population density. So basically, I apply. So this is basically the land. Uh, so I've what I've done to calculate the I've calculated the population in C uh, C column. Uh, but what I have done is I've multiplied the density of the particular country with the land area. So again, it's a simple multiplication feature. I'll do it again once here as well. So mm -hmm. I pull to I click on density column. So it's it chooses A2. Then I use the multiply feature with the asterisk and then I multiply it with land area. And once I press enter, it gives me the value of the population, which is basically the density and land area. And now for the rest of the cells, I don't have to do it for all the cells. What I can do, I can just drag it down and it will automatically calculate for all the cells below. 
So as you can see, it has automatically calculated into. I don't have to put the formula again and again for each and every cell, and I can drag it to the bottom. So this saves time in terms of the calculation part of it. Yeah, as you can see, for 176 countries, the data set. Yeah, and if I need to calculate it as per million, I just simply chose this data set and I divided by a million, and it gave me the figure that. Uh, but I don't have to like go through the so many zeros that, or so many figures that are there. It tells me directly the country's population is 39 million. And similarly, if I stretch it, it will give me for all the countries. Yeah. So I'll move to the second sheet now. So in this sheet, what I have done. So now, so earlier as I was showing you that I arranged the countries as per the um, the GDP per capita. So what I have done here is that I have classified the countries in terms of I have divided it, I divided them as as per the GDP per capita. So as you can see, so there are this set of countries are those which have a GDP of less than GDP per capita less than 4000. And how I did it, so the similar as I was showing earlier about the conditional formatting, I used that and through which I classified these countries with all these three different categories and it has also in this one what i also did i also calculated the population for the countries for poor countries for middle income countries and for rich income countries and i have classified them so that if i am presenting the data set to anybody so as you can also see um, starting with the least gdp per capita to the highest so this is the color coding which i've also done so that it's easy for the persons who are viewing it to understand that which are the countries with higher GDP per capita and it can be used as visualizations as well. Um, any doubts here? Or I can move to. Um, so this is uh, this is GDP per. So this is just to look at how the GDP is GDP per capita of different countries have moved ahead. So I have done it for only for five data points. First data point, so this can be done. So this is just basically this value is basically the sum of GDP per capita for all the countries. So it can. Uh, so if I apply a filter here and let me choose a filter of the year 2020. And. Here I have the GDP per capita. And I just simply go on at the bottom and I apply the formula sum sum formula sum code of the file and I apply it. I change this. I can drag it from the top and yeah. Yes. I can I, I can drag it or I can also directly write it both ways it can be done what why I'm not mentioning here is because if I mention it from one to three six five zero it will collect all of that and it will also collect the data for uh, all the other years as well because then the filter feature may not work so that's why I'm dragging it in this match this fashion it can look a little tiresome but this way at least I'm assured of uh, the fact that I don't uh, commit any mistake when I'm dragging it so go on top drag it to the bottom you can notice the highlight the highlight feature tells that we are selecting those <clears throat> particular values and i get the gdp per capita for the year 2020 but if i now change this value if i instead of using the year 2020 i use the year 2000 then now the G for the values for that particular year are there. And similarly, I can apply the sum feature here. And yes. So this is also something which helps me to show that how the world GDP is expanding. So this is something which can be used to figure out the difference the difference in GDP is that we see GDP per capita that we see over the years. Now that I have data for all the years, 
I will have the value for yes. Yeah. So what Excel has done, it has summed up for all of it, which is something that I was telling that it's something which we need to avoid. And I need 30 seconds because my laptop's battery is about to die. Meanwhile, anybody has questions? I'll charge, put my laptop on charge in the meanwhile. I don't know, Beatrice, maybe now we need to finish this session and have a break and, and okay. leave some yes. time. No? Yes, I we can to... have a 10 minutes yeah. break. Uh, the only thing is, at uh, what time are we finishing the, the seminar today, Belen? In your... Yes, 12 and now, and now, okay, so yeah, we can have a yeah. 10 minutes break now and then uh, start yeah. the third third session. Yeah, let's wait until Baxish back, is back. Baxish, hello. Yes. Yeah, we were yes, saying yes. that maybe we can have, if it's okay with you, we can have a break now and after 10 minutes we start the next session. Yes, All right. yeah, just to comment that this uh, exercise we say Excel is very useful. Eh? Yeah, thank you. Yes. it is very useful, very practical and very down to earth. So thank you so much. So yeah. I will start, the, I will stop the recording. Very good. And in 10 minutes we continue. Thank you, Belen.